Good morning. It's Wednesday, January the 19th, and this is Open Mics with me, Dr. Steve Stice, Chief Medical Officer here at the University of Kansas Health System, broadcasting live with you from the Dahl Simons Family Studio. Today, we're going to talk with Kansas City, Missouri Mayor Quentin Lucas. You remember that the mayor and his family mm. recently battled COVID. Mm. We will talk to him about that experience. Mm -hmm. We welcome him back to our program. Plus, we will talk about the care he had to give his eight-month-old son during the recovery and what parents need to know. Also, what's next for Kansas City as a COVID surge continues to swell and how it is overburdening healthcare systems in the region. So make sure to get your questions sent to us on YouTube, Facebook, and the Medical News Network. You find links to those right here on your screen. We're also going to check in with Dr. Dana Hawkinson, our Medical Director of Infection Prevention and Control with our patient numbers. He'll be joining us in just a few minutes. Like, actually, how about right about now, Hawk? I'm here. You're yeah. here. Yay, yeah. you're back. The numbers, you know, again, holding steady pretty high still. Uh, 124 active infections, 24 of those in the ICU, and 18 on the ventilator. We still have 75 additional patients who have, have been in and met that recovery period or discontinuation. But total of 199, again, 124 of those are actively uh, managed right now. So we got a lot of folks here. Mm -hmm. We got up to 204 yesterday, had a few discharges. Well, um, we're gonna talk next with our guest, Mayor Lucas, in just a moment. But first, Jess, you've got a new video to share with us. I do, Dr. Seitz, good morning. We were able to spend some time in one of our COVID ICU units over the weekend. And we just wanted to give folks an idea of what goes on, things that the public does not get to see. So this first video, you're looking at a very common procedure called proning. It's the process of turning a patient from their back onto their stomach so that they are lying face down. Now, this is done with precise motion to care properly for intubated patients so that they are protecting their airway. This helps many COVID patients with their breathing. It is, again, very common. And as you can see, it takes an entire team of doctors, nurses, and respiratory therapists working together to make sure this happens safely. We also came upon this moment between an older couple, both in the IC unit with COVID. The staff allowed them a short time together so that they could hold hands um, and reassure each other really before they were sent back to their separate rooms. And this next video, sadly, this is happening more and more each day. Staff members here are preparing a deceased patient for transportation to the morgue. The health system has had an extremely high number of COVID deaths already in January. So Dr. Seitz, I just think that showing these videos really helps make it real for folks watching. Again, seeing things that they don't get to see um, and really what's going on behind closed doors. Yeah, it is. It does tear at your heart. And having been, been an ICU doctor for many years, those kind of scenes, whether it's related to COVID-19 or anything else, are difficult. The struggle now and the struggle is real is how much it's affecting all of our patients, but especially those with COVID. And the heartbreak it occurs when, because so often COVID will occur within a family. And that can make the challenge even greater because then you have to ask who's going to take care of the sick, right? When everybody's sick, who takes care of the sick? And in fact, that's exactly the issue that Dr. Lu or that, that Quentin Mayor Lucas has had. Let's turn to our guest. We're honored to have the Kansas City Mayor Quentin Lucas joining us live from Washington, D.C. He's at the annual um, uh, U.S. Conference of Mayors meeting. He's chairing two panels there with the U.S. Department of Justice officials about gun violence and voting rights. Mr. Mayor, thank you for being with us. Thanks for being back with us. And can I say, I like that Kansas City Chiefs hat in the background. Five touchdowns, 400 yards. Kelsey gets a touchdown. That's awesome. Enjoyed that. Hopefully we're going to do the same thing against those Darnell Buffalo Bills. By the way, mm. what did the Pittsburgh mayor send you? You had, you had uh, I think, Joe's Barbecue on the line. Has he come clean with his side of that? You know, he is sending us Pittsburgh Barbecue. I have no idea what that is exactly, <laughs> but... Uh, you know, we will we will make sure that we get it to a good place here in Kansas City this week. I think the wager is likely to be a little bit more predictable with Buffalo Wings, but uh, yeah. we're excited about it. It was a heck of a game, and it is always nice to have, as we talk about all of the deeper things going on, a little bit of joy from football here in and around Kansas City. 
Boy, it is. It was. It, that's exactly what happened. It felt like you had that moment of joy before you had to go back to the reality of what we're facing. So you were fully vaccinated, and as was your wife, and and uh, but your eight month baby boy was not. How are you and your family feeling now after battling COVID? You know, at this point, we are feeling great. I mean, we were we were uh, blessed to have, I think, listened to a lot of the stuff that you've talked about on this show time and time again, that getting vaccinated, getting a booster greatly reduces your likelihood of needing to be hospitalized. It, it reduces a lot of the challenges that you'll have and ultimately reduces the risk of death. And so, you know, any of us who are parents and even many of us who are not um, recognize just it, it, I was okay. Probably the hardest part, and I've said this to others, was when the baby came down sick. And for us, it was just so tough because it's an eight-month-old. As you know, they're they're not really talking to you that much. Stuffed noses, all that, and um, so it was. It was trying. You know, the fever got pretty high, but we had some wonderful uh, folks that we could call on and, and said, you know, you're doing all the right things. But at the same time, I think it just goes to show how how challenging COVID-19 is. We were vaccinated, but you still have family members that uh, might fall ill who can't get vaccinated. Those five and under certainly those with any number of issues and ailments at any age group and so it was it was an interesting you know slog for a little while after i moved out of the garage and realized that my wife and baby had come down to the yeah. <laughs> so they let you out of the garage well that's good i guess it's probably a little warmer <laughs> it was it was a pretty cold snap when i was out there but yeah you know, I, I have to say this again and, and i just have to make it emphatic because i know since i came down and other folks have during the omicron wave who are fully vaxxed there are some out there who incorrectly say well why would i get vaccinated but you know i was feeling pretty good and for those who might have seen me on the news afterwards i think i was able to you know do interviews and zooms while quarantining in, in a good place that is very different than what we just saw on the screen that you all helpfully provided and i know that some of your medical partners around town have shared with different news outlets i read a piece in the star yesterday about just how tough it is for so many people who are hospitalized who said, I wish I could have gotten vaccinated, I wish I would have gotten vaccinated rather. It makes a world of difference. And you know what, it did right by me. Yeah, and it absolutely does. And it's that vaccination and now with the booster that really reduces your chance of severe illness defined as having to be hospitalized with a lot of oxygen or in the ICU or on a ventilator. And and I think what we know is that our patients who are in that position are almost 95, 98 percent of them are unvaccinated. You know, so you may get Omicron. OK, fine. You got Omicron, but you're going to be OK if you've been vaccinated. And, and to your point, you actually don't get it nearly as sick as long as you've been vaccinated. But watching your son be sick, that had to be hard as a parent. It was very hard. I mean, one of the more interesting parts of it all, and that's a fun picture of him. That's a great that, picture. Um, yeah, he, he's he's not in the garage, though. I'm just saying he's not in the garage. <laughs> you were in the garage. He's not in the garage. Exactly. He does not have to hang out with me. We do not have a fireplace like that in the garage. I, I will say this, though, that, um, you know, it, it was probably the toughest thing. Over the last year to two years, he's only been around for one of them, but... Um, you know, he, he hasn't really been exposed to much because of a lot of the responsible stuff that we're doing, not in big crowds. So for your first fever to be something that serious is a real challenge. And, and I will note this, um, whether you call our friends at KU Health System, Children's Mercy, anyone, a lot of the nurse lines are very helpful in saying, step one, don't freak out. And we had a lot of friends that said that. Step two, there are there are good ways to treat all of this over the counter. So um, it is something that's very important for you to take seriously. But you know, one of the bigger things is we had to make sure he stayed hydrated, which again, tough for a baby when they're stuffed and if they're still nursing, um, any number of issues. So it was, it was a, a real concern. And I was probably the most delighted when we saw him feeling better. And, you know, I've talked to particularly a lot of teachers um, who I know have families and we continue to have a lot of battles in Missouri and Kansas about mask rules in the schools and keeping schools open. And a lot of them have said, I don't want to take it home to my family. Well, you know, I got to see that personally as to really why you don't want to. 
it's one thing to say that, you know, it, it'll never come for you. And I, I talk to people all the time who think that they're magical. But, you know, I would ask a lot of these people who are unvaccinated walking around now, you know, do you want to deal with those serious challenges? Do you want to deal with some of the issues that we face? Because I got to deal with one unvaccinated person in my household, a child, who dealt with a really serious situation. It's fine now, don't get me wrong, but, uh, you know, I don't wish that on anybody. Yeah, I think uh, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I, I might I have three wonderful children, and and um, I remember the days when they would get sick. But I think as a parent, this has had to be the hardest of times. I mean, my kids grew up at a much different time, and now either you're trying to figure out how to school when they can't get to school, or you're trying to figure out what the where they're safe, where they're not safe, where they mask, where they don't mask, who they can go out with, who they can't go out with. I just this has to be one of the most challenging times to be a parent in a very long time. And I bet you're hearing that as the mayor. Uh, that's exactly right. I mean, it is, at first, it, it really makes your heart sink because literally at every age, parents are greatly concerned. I hear from high school parents who are saying, well, uh, my child's wearing a mask, but will the peer pressure in a lot of those schools that have removed mask debt mandates make it hard for them to be able to do that? For you know, younger children that still need adult supervision, what does that mean for the parents taking off work, finding someone to watch the child? What do the parents do? And then certainly for our younger children who can't get vaccinated, so many challenges relating to making sure they don't get exposed you know and it's why for me it's all in some ways simple let's do all we can to stop the seriousness of this pandemic let's make sure that we're getting vaccinated so we're not filling up icus when you're in those indoor crowded environments putting on a mask which is you know not that hard to do and i know doctor you have mentioned it a lot for folks i maybe I, maybe you know, once I, or twice yeah, you know, I, I don't get, all right, well, I don't get it's all so political, too. I mean, for me, it, it's a function of, you know, it's not that hard. And, you know, I know a lot of the stores I've been into, thankfully, um, you know, have masking rules up and signs. But, you know, a lot of these places, to me, it's just a sign of respect when you're going to some different things. And so, you know, I think that's something that we can continue to push. But ultimately, it is people just realizing that we have to be responsible and looking out for all of the others that, that walk among us. You know, I've, I've enjoyed the opportunity as a mayor to actually go back to, to schools and city government buildings and all of that and you put your mask on before you're going in you know that to me is something that's that's very simple and it allows a classroom not to be out and we've all been reading the headlines here in kansas city of late where you know you have school districts where hundreds of students are out sick hundreds of teachers are out sick and i still remember i had a call at the very beginning of this calendar year when ironically i was on quarantine and there were some superintendents who are saying we don't we don't want to deal with the mask issue there are too many rules changing can't we be done with it and within days a lot of them said all right yeah, we need this and so that's why we'll continue to stand up and fight for our, our schools to be able to have mask rules we'll handle any, any litigation we face here on the missouri side i know kansas has a number of different issues too but for us it's not about control or power or politics it's doing all we can to keep people safe well, and that keeps the things open, keeps keeps school open. Any chance that there will be a mask mandate for Kansas City? I know that's got to be difficult in Missouri with the Attorney General right now. Yeah, you know, it's something that we continue to evaluate, the, the universal mask mandate. I know a lot of folks, uh, particularly from the health professions, but also a lot of businesses have said, can you, can you reissue a universal mask mandate? We, we continue to evaluate that. We certainly are engaging with our lawyers regularly because we get more saber rattling from our state attorney general. Um, part of why part of our focus has really been how do we get more folks vaccinated how do we make sure that we're, we're spreading correct information about what's going on and, and something folks may not know. Um, and I know you had him on as a guest many times when we had prior iterations of our mask order, our health director, Dr. Rex Archer, um, had a good number of staff folks that were out 
making sure that they were enforcing the order, had to um, deal with folks that sometimes were threatening. It was a, you know, the type of situation that you wish didn't exist in this country, state and city, uh, but did in a lot of situations. Right now, I've appreciated that our health department staff is working very hard to get vaccine clinics set up where they can, answering calls, working on the information side. And I will note that even though we've had um, some federal support to help fund our health response to COVID-19, as you know, Dr. Stites, it's it's sadly not enough. When you look no. at the number of folks that needed to work overtime, the number of vaccine clinics we've had to set up. And so in a way, it's almost like triaging public resources as well. So we continue to, to think about it and, and work on that. I know my friends in St. Louis County have issued another mask rule. They're not quite enforcing it in the same way and they're in litigation with the state AG. But look, we recognize its importance and continue in Kansas City to recommend um, masking indoors uh, if if, if you no, just mask it indoors, no ifs, ands, or buts. Uh, and, and certainly part of why you see a school mask mandate is partially because we have found all of our school partners are typically cooperative. We have not had to have substantial threats and we're able to help defend the schools from either angry parents, angry groups, angry lawsuits. And we'll continue to try to expand our focus there. Yeah, it is disappointing when we can say no shirt, no shoes, no service or have either, you know, you have to wash your hands if you're a restaurant worker. I mean, you know, simple things um, to help protect the health of the public. But then the attorney general wants to make this so political about uh, uh, about masking when it's obviously an act of love and caring and, and trying to keep people well. And then you look inside hospitals and you see what's happening and, you know, not being able to do surgeries, up, uprooting people's lives and watching them uh, come in the ICU and die. And we say, OK, so why, t- tell me again why we're making this so political, because it really doesn't work. Mm-hmm. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, what you're hearing at the conference from other mayors about how their cities and what they're how, what they're coming on to and how they're facing Omicron. You know, I appreciate you asking that because. Um it is a grave concern for all of us. And, and you read the things that I was, I'm doing panels on today. I'm doing a panel on, on criminal justice and gun violence, on voting rights, huge weighty issues. Those but are COVID, big issues. But COVID is the number one issue you face with every mayor. It is, it's a concern, you know, in the same way that it's, it's harder to um, do surgeries or in hospitals, you're having to cancel a number of things. A lot of our focus is on ranging from education to how we fight gun violence, how we get people registered to vote. It, you know, it's, it's not on hold, but it's made a lot more difficult so long as we're facing this surge. You know, before this conference, the mayor of St. Louis called me uh, and she said, you know, I, I, I'm not sure I should go given a lot of the challenges with COVID-19. Some of the mayors who are here uh, talked to the mayors of San Diego and Phoenix last night about how things are going for them. And, you know, the crises that we face in Kansas and Missouri are exactly what they're saying. A huge number of folks that are unvaccinated, including, unfortunately, a lot of public sector employees in the state of Arizona. The governor's issued a rule that says, you you know, you you can't actually look to vaccination status of EMS workers, your paramedics, something that's very challenging for San Diego facing that same issue. A number of folks who think they're kind of invincible and then end up getting infected. I mean, we are all working hard on how do we get vaccinated? How do we get more people correct information? And whether your city, and I'll be visiting with the mayor of New York City, I believe tomorrow, um, whether you're a city that has vaccine passports like New York and masks everywhere, or you're a city that has no rules like some in our metro area, and the hardest part right now for all of us is how do we fight misinformation? How do you get people to say this is still important? How do you get people to say that picking up a mask to wear it indoors on the run to the big convenience store or making sure that you're getting vaccinated and boosted, even if you think all these other things are issue? So, you know, I, I, I I think that's what we're really trying to get to. I know the the federal uh, government is trying to get to that too. The president will be visiting with us at the conference on Friday. So we're all working to get as many tests out as possible to get correct information. And that's why we appreciate shows like yours, which, you know, I hope we could get it national, Dr. Stites, although uh, I wouldn't want to check your emails after all that. (laughs) Sometimes they do get a little bit exciting. You know, the problem is that people just want to spread rumors. It's called being, you just want to be a rum wrong. I'm going to be a rumor wrong 
longer. And uh, at some level, that, yeah. that, that, that just makes things that much harder, right? And uh, puts us all, the, the sad part, it really does put us all back in jeopardy a lot. Um, so you appeared on CBS Sunday morning show to Face the Nation. What did you say when you were asked about the Omicron surges being up 25% here in the metro and its, and its impact on our hospital systems in, in the Kansas City metro? Um, you know, I, I think what I had noted then uh, what, and what I would say today, it, it is a dramatic concern. I, you know, I get a chance to talk not just to, to you, Dr. Stites, but, but, you know, hospital directors and administrators all around, actually, the Missouri and Kansas. And uh, there, is, there is just substantial concern. I have grave concern with our ability to deliver basic public services. You know, it isn't just actually in our schools. We had, I believe, roughly 100 plus firefighters who were out recently dealing with COVID-19. And we don't actually have that many firefighters. And so when you're looking at 15% of the workforce, that starts to challenge your ability to respond to 911 calls. The same types of challenges are hitting our police department. The same challenges hit our sanitation workers and others. And then you look to that in every jurisdiction around our region. That's why this continues to be something that's important. And so, you know, what I shared one was I hope a little bit of truth that this is real. It's not a blue state, red state thing. We live in red states. And to me, it's not a red or a blue issue. It's just a reality that our ability to do the stuff that people expect us to be able to do, to be able to take care of our children, to educate our children, to respond to a, a 911 call if someone's had a heart attack or a car accident, you know, that's, that's frustrating right now in Kansas City dramatically. And, you know, some of the very small mitigation strategies that we have discussed, getting vaccinated, masks indoors, are the sorts of things that are very easy for us to do. And I, and I will say this, and I know um, my friend Governor Kelly has faced this on the Kansas side, and a lot of mayors and, and county executives around the region yesterday in Jackson County, Missouri, I know they were unable to get a vote on restoring just the school mask mandate. Um, we're running into a time where there is such substantial challenge in, in government discussion, in cable news panels each night, that what we're really trying to do is spread real, truthful information and hopefully get through to a lot of folks. You know, a while back, I foolishly gave my cell phone number out to the whole Kansas City region, which, by the way, was a terrible idea. But... Um, <laughs> You know, in the in the years since, and that was actually right before the COVID pandemic hit us in Kansas City. But in the years since, I actually get random messages from people all the time. And there is a roughly, I think she's about a 55-year-old black woman, lives in Overland Park, but texts me all the time about mm -hmm. policing and everything under the sun. Mm -hmm. And she said to me, Lucas, I finally got my shots. And I said, well, that's, that's good. Why? And she said, I can't afford to be out for six weeks or longer and i'm seeing more of these stories of people laid up in an icu and i said you know you made the right choice and i think it's important for a lot of us who have correct information and not from a judgmental perspective or anything like that she had whatever thoughts she had before as to why she wasn't getting it but she said you know i'm starting to see i i I, I, my family needs me to be able to go to work. My family needs me to be healthy. And we need to share that with more people, that this is about taking care of your families, yourself, so many others in our community. And, um, you know, I, I'm, I'm thinking that we'll continue to share that as much as we can, no matter what legislators say or Tucker Carlson or anybody else. And so, you know, that's why we'll, we'll keep pushing what we need to do here. Yeah, you know, it is, a, it is, it is, um, difficult when you work amongst COVID-19 every day and you see its real impact on people to then watch folks go out and somehow along the way put their moral compass in a drawer and close the drawer and said it's okay for me to not know the difference between truth and lies and I'm just going to say whatever I want for my own political or economic or any other type of gain and in the meantime, that drawer is still out there, and I don't have to think about it anymore whether I'm telling you the truth or I'm telling you a lie. And when we start that, it's very hard to make policy that makes sense because you can't distinguish between what's fake and what's not. 
And I think what you have uh, to me from a simple healthcare perspective, stand in our line, some of the stuff that's out there, you, you just shake your head out and you're like, do you really understand COVID-19 should not be the leading cause of death amongst police officers in the United States. That's terrible. It's completely unnecessary. You should have virtually zero death amongst police officers because if you're vaccinated and wear a mask, that's not going to happen. And yet there are the, somehow lies have become truth and suffering results. And we, I don't know how we correct that outside of saying, okay, well, let's just, we're going to just, at least with us, we're just going to keep telling the truth because that mm -hmm. way maybe somebody will take that and keep spreading that information. But when lies become truth, suffering follows. And I think that's what we're seeing happen throughout the region. Um, and, you know, Dr. Steins, can I, I, can I say one thing on that? We had a long city council meeting in Kansas City last week about about vaccines, you know, and some folks were saying all of these things that were not factual. And one of the things that has concerned me the most, there's this big narrative out there from some set of people that say, well, you all, Dr. Stites and others, you shouldn't be talking about vaccines. You should be talking about comorbidities and people losing weight and everything under the sun. Mm -hmm. And, you know, what I always want to say to those folks is, you know, if you can have a vaccine, to your point about police officers, if you can have a vaccine that so dramatically reduces your likelihood of dying, of being in an ICU, of being intubated, why don't you take it? There are these kind of magical theories and all of that as if we live in a medieval era where people say, well, I can't get it because X or Y, and it's astonishing how many of them do. And, you know, sometimes people beat up on local media, but I've been proud of seeing stories about, you know, very fit and active baseball coaches and Lee Summit, mm -hmm. or folks that were dance teachers in the Northland, or, or all types of folks who not only have found themselves sick with COVID-19, but in some situations have died. It is something that is impacting people who are skinny, who are not skinny, who are young, who are old, and it's impacting them all around our city and our region and our country. And it is shameful to me that there are people out there who are trying to say, oh, I know the magic idea of what happens or what will not. You know, Dr. Stites, I know you and your colleagues walk those corridors. You see the different folks dealing with this and you see a lot of different folks and there's largely a commonality and it's unvaccinated folks. Yeah, that's exactly that right so powerful and the difference we can make and to think you wow. would sit back and you watch people say well it's going to make you sick yeah right well okay what is it 95 percent of nfl players and 95 percent of the nba or yeah. whatever have it and I, you know what it looks like they're still playing football they're still playing <laughs> basketball they're still playing soccer you know if you just step back you think okay do you understand the complete lack of reality of what you're saying it just isn't true and i don't know how to tell you it just isn't true we've given over, well over 100,000 shots here, and nobody's come back to us and said, "Yeah, I can't shoot my ba I can't shoot baskets anymore." Yeah. I, I can't, wait for those of us like me. I can't use my fly rod anymore. I, I can't. <laughs> you know, I can't watch Star Trek anymore. That's not the reality, right? And and and, and in fact, when you watch the best quarterback in football go out and to store to the Steelers, and he's out there out front saying, "I've been back, but I've got all my vaccines." Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I think he's still pretty good. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think all these, these opinions continue to be just that, opinions that are unsupported by science and data. And we, we know that these athletes continue to have problems even after they recover, even if they've had mild illness. We heard um, some coaches from uh, the big European soccer leagues still talking about those elite athletes and how they are not coming back as fresh. If and they're being, not vaccinated. Right. Yeah, exactly. Even after illness, right. uh, not coming back, and this was even before vaccines when just COVID was, was we were in the pre-vaccine era, they are still having fatigue and just not able to train and do those things they were able to do before. So I think it is important, even these elite athletes can suffer some ill effects for some time, even after mild yeah, illness. We, but we don't want to talk about the data. We just want to talk about the made up news. Speaking of some news, let's see what news reporters are on the line, Jess. Hi, good morning. Lindsay from uh, KSHB 41 is here. How are you guys doing? Good. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, I have uh, one question for Dr. Seitz and several, well, a couple for Quentin Lucas. Mayor, good morning. Uh, first of all, very glad to hear that you and your family have recovered. Uh, good to hear that. Um, you referenced this in a tweet yesterday 
and we about groups coming forward talking about whether or not there are you know possible disciplinary actions for mass mandates in schools and we've seen the attorney general tweet in the last 24 hours that he is finalizing some legal actions when it comes to mass mandates can you give us the latest have you heard anything in regard to any new legal action Mm -hmm. But, you know, on, on the attorney general's uh, threats, it, it, here's what I'll say. And um, I will note that I know this is a, a, a nonpartisan or bipartisan show. You have folks from all walks here. And so to the extent I speak to it, I'm, I'm speaking just to somebody who uh, believes in science and public health. On, on the threats, the attorney general's threats are entirely without merit, hence why he has not filed a lawsuit, yet instead he issued a press release to garner attention, and unfortunately he did. Lawsuits have been filed against school districts in Springfield, Missouri, in Columbia, Missouri, here in the Kansas City area. Most all of those have been dismissed, and the school districts have prevailed. Here in Kansas City, Missouri, we have fought lawsuits uh, from private businesses, from a parent association that purports to represent a part of a community, which it does not, that was also dismissed by a federal judge. And so we believe we stand on solid legal footing in ensuring that if there is legal action, Kansas City will be successful in the event that the Attorney General files legal action against any of the school districts here in the Kansas City area. We will look to enter into that action as a third party, which you can do under legal rules so that we can also defend the position because the way we did it was on purpose. In Kansas City, you have to have masks on if you're in a school. And so it actually is not necessarily a choice of the North Kansas City schools or Kansas City public schools or others, at least while they're in Kansas City boundaries. So we will stand by that order and fight it vigorously. In terms of, of penalties to um, school children, I, I know no school wants to do that. That's why we've primarily prevailed upon parents to be reasonable and sensible and not and put your kids into just stupid political fights for no reason at all. Uh, and most schools, I think, have been able to handle that fairly well. I know that there are some situations where children have to go remote in a different classroom if they're not wearing masks, but this is not a goal of being punitive towards children or, or anyone, really. It's instead saying, how can we make sure that we can keep going to school in person? We all remember the spring of 2020, the challenges we had in a number of different school environments. This is how we, we stay in school now. What's the communication like between the city and school districts regarding um, struggles with absences, staff and student? Is that something you guys talk about every day? Is that really the district handles on their own? Yeah, you know, we do talk about some of the, uh, the, the struggles we've had. I'll, I'll start actually with uh, the enforcement issue. And I haven't name checked the store a lot, but I'll actually give them props here. Uh, and it's part of our, our discussion and consideration on universal mask mandates. The Walmart at 133rd and State Line in South Kansas City was doing a really good job of enforcing mask rules, but every day just about, they'd have people who would come in, mistreat staff, yell at them, had to call the police repeatedly, and didn't want to get shut down because of non-compliance. It is unfortunate, and <laughs> Dr. Stites, in some ways, it's unbelievable that you have a number of retail establishments, particularly in the, in the big box and convenience store arena, where they put a sign up, they'll do any number of things, and people just think they have a God-given right to enter however they want and create issues for law enforcement, create issues for so many others. And so, you know, that is a concern that we have had in Kansas City that we continue to have with some, and, and that continues to, I think, kind of color how we're looking to respond to folks is is some negative action the best way against say that walmart or is there something else we can do and so that's why we've continued to i think try to come on these programs i know the health director has been active in those we work with our peers around the region in connection with that but that's what we look to do but but one area that i have not mentioned yet um early in the crisis and i know we talked about that on this program uh, the core four wyandotte county johnson county kansas city missouri and jackson county um, we're able to come together to discuss mask rules and other types of items. It is time for us to get back in touch. We've had a few personnel changes, both the Johnson County Commission and, and Wyandotte County with their leadership. And so I, I'll plan to probably convene a meeting too. Uh, it's not lost on me that several mayors and councils in Northeast Johnson County put a new mask rule on. Um, it is something that continues to be a consideration for us, particularly if we can act once again as a regional group. And we would applaud. Those of us in healthcare would applaud about that. 
Just saying. I'm very aware, and uh, I know that that we've continued to fight hard for those sorts of things. You know, probably the hardest part is in a lot of these county commission votes, and I have watched with great interest both in Johnson County and in Jackson County, Missouri, where you keep having these incredibly close votes about masking. And, you know, one thing I would ask for those who are watching and who are concerned about these issues, you know, give some encouragement to the representatives that are actually supporting responsible mask rules. You know, all of us hear from everyone negative, and sometimes you you just think that that's that's everybody in the Kansas City area because they're they're blowing up your inbox and calling you. You know, as you think these things are important, make sure you share that. Make sure you share your support. Make sure if you can get signed up for public comment, you make your voice heard in some of these meetings, so that we know it isn't just kind of a, a heckler's veto on any responsible rules, but instead smart, effective things that we can do to protect everyone. I just cannot put words in your mouth. You're saying you're considering very soon getting back together with the core four to consider a new mask mandate. Yes, yes, I'll, okay. I'll say yes to you. I usually don't say a clear yes to, to media all the time, but yeah, mm-hmm. I, and they make a story, it may not, but nevertheless, I think it's something that is, um, it's important for us. It's important for us to go back to acting in concert. I, I continue to believe, and I know we've talked about this on this program, the actions we took together that apply to roughly 2 million people in this metro area and then a lot of other jurisdictions nearby that followed and worked in concert with us, save lives. I think it is important right now for us to try to get that same consensus as to how can we save lives, how can we lessen the demand on our ICUs and our hospital networks, how can we make sure our schools stay open. And so that's something that I think I scheduled the last core four meeting. I'll reach out to my colleagues again soon to do another. Dr. Stites, uh, I think a lot of people are looking at what's happening on the coast with cases beginning to fall and holding out hope for that. Is locally, are we beginning to see the slightest glimmer of that or not at all? Um, you know, so our numbers have been kind of going up over the last week. You know, this time last week, I think we were around 110 or so. We got up to 120. So we're we're still seeing quite a bit of COVID. I, th- I think one of the challenges we've had is that in some areas of the country, there wasn't the Delta surge. And so what we've seen is a Delta surge that was continuing from Thanksgiving and Christmas. Then the Omicron surge came on on top of it, which really is what pushed us over the top. We tend to run one to two weeks behind New York right now in the Omicron numbers, but mixed into all that was Delta. So it made our data a little bit harder to interpret. New York didn't have the same Delta surge we did, right? So it made it a little harder to interpret. What we think is that sometime towards the end of January, we'll see the numbers in our city level off and maybe start to drop. And it may be a little sooner than that. It's just hard to know because we're not sure how much of a, how much of everything is Delta and how much is Omicron. The wastewater testing, which runs about a week to 10 days ahead of testing in our clinics, looks like it switched to being predominantly Omicron about 10 or 14 days ago. So we should be more dominantly Omicron now. Again, we don't do enough genomic analysis in the U.S. Mm-hmm. To the mayor's earlier no. point, we have mm-hmm. underfunded public uh, resources, public health so badly we don't get enough information. Mm-hmm. But um, the the we would project that we that we are likely in an Omicron surge, that likely we are seeing that as our dominant cause for hospitalization right now, though that's a little iffier. We expect that that will peak sometime in the next, you know, I, I'm going to say seven to 10 days and hopefully start to decrease after that. The problem is when you've peaked at such a high level, then even as you start to fall, you're still at a really high level. And the problem is that hospitalizations run seven to 14 days behind what the public peak is. So we expect hospitalizations to continue to rise for a while. We're still canceling 50% of our elective surgeries here at KU. We hope to cut get back to about 25% somewhere around the end of this month and hopefully back sometime in you know February to resume more of a full schedule. But that's all dependent upon how uh, folks respond. And, and what I would say very clearly, we know how to bend the curve. We have bent this curve multiple times. It, it is the science is real. The science is hard, meaning it's really good hard evidence. And it is absolutely clear that masking works. There is no real debate about that. And there are there's made up debates, but there's no real debate about it. Um, we have kept people safe inside our hospital for the entire duration of this crisis. And why is that? 
because we have to, we have a masking rule inside our hospitals, which fortunately the federal government has upheld and everybody's upheld. So the um, the reality is masking works. If we had masking in place, we'd see fewer um, COVID hospitalizations. We had fewer COVID hospitalizations. We could do a better job at taking care of people with time sensitive diagnoses. We've said on this program multiple times and continue to message that we cannot get transfers in from small towns, which means those folks are suffering and str suffering and struggling. The data was very clear when we looked at the mission control app that the number of people dying in emergency rooms uh, is up five times in, De in, in December. Um, so, I mean, the, the data is overwhelming about the problems that we face. Um, and, and, and I think that uh, we would, we would, har we would um, love any type of support we could to, find, to help mitigate the crisis. Those are all my questions. Thank you. Dr. Seitz, I have one from Fox 4 um, for Mayor Lucas. And you may have touched on this, Mayor, but just curious um, if you anticipate the city's mask requirement for K through 12 to be renewed after those 30 days. Um, it extends until, I believe, uh, the first week of February. Uh, I just listened to Dr. Stites' um, discussion of where we are and, and where we look to be. And while perhaps there is progress ahead, if we look east of Kansas City, I think that there will continue to be a significant concern. We'll always listen to health professionals or medical professionals and others. But I am I'm not in a position, I think, to suggest that it, we can have the order just lapse on that date. And I I would expect it to probably be extended for another 30 days when we get to that point in February. Jess, I hear there's some community questions out there. I do. I have some community questions and comments for Mayor Lucas. Um, Janet has a question, and I think it um, is a question coming in in different ways from different viewers. But she says, please ask Mayor Lucas to reinstate the mask mandate in KC. Just make mm -hmm. it happen, Mayor Lucas. Mm -hmm. Can you maybe explain sure. to her and others how that works? I mean, I think a lot of people out in the community just mm -hmm. think that you go to the mayor, you, um, you ask them to make the changes, and they can just do it like that. Can you help her understand how that works on a state level? Yeah, um, so the law has changed for, for us on the Missouri side and it continues to change more often than it should. Earlier in the pandemic and indeed until probably um, the summer of this year, uh, the mayor was in a mayor, county executive Frank White up in Jackson County and health directors in Clay or Platt County um, could just issue a an, an emergency order and, you all are wearing masks. And indeed, that's what happened for the probably the first year and a half or so of this pandemic. Most of our orders were things that I would just be able to announce. they become a thing, we'd, we'd get sued, we'd usually win, but that was how it went. The legislature changed it in a few different ways. One, um, now in most situations, it needs to go through a legislative body. Um, and there's a time limit for how long you can have that mask rule. It, it, then there are all types of different public health requirements. There needs to be a basis for the information, which usually is a fine level to match from the health department. So you're getting a recommendation from them that goes through the legislative process. There's a time limit. But you can only have them for so many days over a given period. They're very hard to extend, et cetera. And so, you know, that's that's where we are. Um, and another thing that has not helped in, in the state of Missouri, Governor Parson uh, allowed the emergency order relating to COVID-19 to lapse. And so that also then makes it harder for us to trigger those types of issues and requirements. All that said, uh, it is still possible to do it. it. It takes a number of steps to get there, but it's something that's possible. The other, of course, thing that is a challenge now is that almost every mask rule then is subjected to litigation from the state attorney general immediately. Um, as I noted before, schools have won almost all their cases. In Kansas City, we've won all of ours. St. Louis County did have a loss, and I believe uh, there have been a few other challenges uh, for us over time. So that, that's why it, it doesn't happen magically. Uh, but, but again, um, I am still the mayor and uh, I don't think that's an excuse. And so um, this is why it is something we continue to evaluate, recognizing just that we might find ourselves in a situation that, um, you know, we'll, we'll just have to get in fights after it's all done. And for better or worse, it usually takes a little while for things to get through courts. And maybe by the time we have a hearing, we would have been able to get ourselves out of this high wave. And I think I know listening to Dr. Stites and others, that might be what they recommend. Yeah, we may think that's true. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Mayor, I know. 
Mayor, I know you have to get going, so I just have two quick comments from one of our from our viewers. Donna, um, giving you some warm fuzzies this morning. She's from St. Joseph. She's lived in Kansas City for years, and she really appreciates your leadership. And then Tanya has a serious question: Is the mayor really wearing his chief's cap on the streets of D.C.? <laughs> so um, maybe for a future appearance on this show, I will show you that, yes, I wear my chief's cap on the streets of D.C. I will also say this. Last year, I went to the president's inauguration outside, of course, was wearing my cap the whole time. And some people saw me on video like, you were the guy in the chief's hat. I love it. <laughs> I will make this final point, And I appreciate the comment from St. Joseph and so many others. You know, early in the pandemic, when we were getting... Uh, our teeth kicked in, I'll say. And Dr. Stites knows it and others from a lot of negative folks. I, I got an email from a teacher in Maryville, Missouri. And we get these from time to time from throughout Kansas and Missouri. Uh, and she said, keep doing what you're doing because even though our jurisdiction can't get mask rules passed and there's all types of other things coming sometimes from our politicians, we're listening and my neighbors are listening and they're sharing that information. You know, when you are in politics or media long enough, you actually learn the, the, the best person to share information is actually somebody who's in your family or a friend. It's why sometimes social media can be such a threat. And I have appreciated all of you that watch this program or watch your local news and, and listen to facts and then go share that with somebody else. Because, you know, Dr. Stites and I can shout from the mountaintops, you know, wear a mask, get vaccinated. But, you know, if, you're, if your girlfriend says it, or if your mom, or if your children say, go ahead and get vaccinated, then that's the most important thing. And I promise I'll wrap on this point. I was visiting with uh, students from uh, a school in South Kansas City, young women, and they actually talked to them about how they were able to get their grandparents vaccinated. These were teenagers who learned about vaccines, learned about their safety, and got some folks in their 70s to get vaccinated. I mean, that's the sort of power that you all have too. And so I encourage you to keep using it. And we'll make sure um, that we try to do right by all of you. I certainly hear the comments relating to um, reinstituting a mask requirement universally in Kansas City. We'll make sure we have our meeting with the core four and hopefully in the, in the next week or so, we may even have more information for you. Mayor, good luck with the core four. Thank you so much for being on the program. You're welcome back. Let's get you back soon. Love having yep. you. And uh, thank you for all your good work that you're doing and for your advocating. And as someone else who grew up like you in this area, we do care and we do love it and we want it to do right. So thank you, yep. sir. Thank you all so much. Jess, are there any other community questions out there that we could answer for a couple of minutes? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. I was I was hoping we could get to some of these. And hold on one sec. Um, so can you, uh, can you find, when should a friend, so this is from a woman asking, when should my friend be alarmed and go to urgent care and ER? We've, we've talked about this over the last week or so. She's, yeah. her breathing is fine, pulse is fine, but she's super tired, congested, can't stand for more than 15 minutes. Can you help people know when to go to the ER if, yeah. if they have COVID symptoms? Hawkeye, you see a lot more of these COVID mm -hmm. patients and yeah. generally the rule has been when you get short of breath, but other things yeah. might bring you to the emergency room. Let's talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, initially in that initial viral stage, so that's when you have it, the symptoms are starting. It's in that first, say, week to 10 days. A lot of people will come to the emergency department just because they're either having high fevers, um, they are having some cough or body aches. Those people tend to go, uh, go home. They have that shorter length of stay, but it's really those people then that start having that increased cough, that increased shortness of breath, um, maybe chest discomfort. Those people then are what we are seeing are the more uh, moderate to severe disease people. And those people are just really understanding their body and what kind of symptoms are they having. Certainly fatigue can be a symptom of just that initial phase as well. But it's just understanding what your symptoms are, how your body is reacting and, you know, compared to your baseline in it. If it is, just like you said, Steve, increased cough or that shortness of breath, maybe it's chest discomfort or other issues now, which are continuing to either go on, not get better, or actually get worse. And, and those are really the typical ones uh, that we see. Jess? John is curious if you could speak to any uh, current research on the safety of the vaccine for children. Is there some place online that you could point him to go for good, accurate mm -hmm. information? 
I'd go to the I'd go to the CDC website, uh, Hawkeye, yeah. because I think mm-hmm. that's good and accurate and the best and most accurate information we have. You know, remember we're still building this airplane frequently mm-hmm. as we fly it, and so the information does change. And when we say over the age of 12, it's pretty clear it's very safe. There are very few side effects. I think what people are probably thinking about: what about between yeah. five and 12? Because yeah. that's an age group that's eligible. And then we're still debating about what is less than five. So, Hawk, I'm thinking CDC website. I think the repository of the CDC is probably the best one. I would agree with you. You can also check the uh, American Academy of Pediatrics. They probably have fairly good resources. Um, The American Academy of Family Medicine may also have very good resources for that as they deal with pediatrics as well. I would really start with those three sources first. The only other source I would think, you know, Pfizer posted all its data online. It's all available, so the CDC and the FDA. So those are places you can go. If you Google that stuff, you'll get to the information. Mm -hmm. Um, You can even go read the two or 300 pages of data that's out there about some of it that that may be hard to read. I -hmm. find it hard to read. It's very good bedtime reading. Uh, I have gotten through most of it, but holy cow. One more, more question, Jess. Yeah, okay. a couple more questions. Um, so Donna just is asking if you could please clarify, and I know we have done this, but we need to do it again. Clarify the categoriz- categorization of patients. Um, do the number of patients that we report out every day, does that include patients that come in for other reasons but just happen to test positive for COVID? Or is that 124 <clears throat> patients that are hospitalized because they are truly ill with COVID itself? Yeah, so we're going to actually, we're, we're yeah. putting together a, a more thorough report about that because we get this question a lot. So here's what I'll tell you. And these are a little bit of generalities. We'll do, we'll, we'll have more specifics about this. What we have in, in, our, in our EPIC is our EMR. We, we look to see what vaccine status is and this recorded in EPIC. And then we go back and we actually have to do some detective work to figure out exactly if people, do they get vaccinated somewhere else or they haven't told us on admission or they were too sick to talk or whatever. We, we, have, to, we have to continually update that. So in general, we know that um, the, that the, the, the overwhelming majority of patients, overwhelming majority of patients who are symptomatic and here with COVID are unvaccinated. That many of the patients who are asymptomatic are the ones who are vaccinated. So the reality is that, that the people who are symptomatic, they, come, they can't get their endoscopy, they can't get their surgery because they're symptomatic. And they're symptomatic because they're not vaccinated. When you step back and look at the people who are vaccinated, those are the ones who tend to be asymptomatic, and they're the ones who tend to be able to go ahead and get their, their, their procedure to get their surgery, because they're really not mm-hmm. sick, they're just positive. Mm-hmm. So um, we'll, we'll, we'll document that to you in the future, but what we're gonna end up trying to show you is who's vaccinated, who had one shot, who had two shots, who's had the booster, et cetera, and then we'll try and break that information down a little bit more. But our, when we give you the number, We're telling you about all the COVID positive patients we have, whether they're symptomatic or asymptomatic, the overwhelming majority are symptomatic. And I'm talking like in the 70, 80, 90% are symptomatic. And almost all of those people are unvaccinated. And then if you go to the ICU, it's like 95% of people are unvaccinated. Mm -hmm. So when people try to spin all these other stories and excuses, it's just not true. I mean, I, I don't know how to say it any other way. It's just not true. Last question, Dr. Stites. Michelle is asking, are they planning to make an Omicron-specific vaccine? Mm. She has heard that it is so vastly different from the other variants yeah. that they think it may mm. be necessary and that Omicron has actually been around from the beginning and that it's not actually a variant or mutation. Okay, okay, let's talk a lot. Some yeah. people have talked a little bit about Omicron almost being its own thing, but mm-hmm. it's not been around since the beginning. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that is a theory that some of these viral variants are out there, but if they get into certain situations, they can start to then uh, increase and then displace the other viral variants. So, uh, but, but I don't know that that's necessarily too important now in, uh, in understanding that. Uh, we know that other viral variants have come in and displaced other ones, such as Alpha, being displaced by Delta, what have you. Um, what we do know is that the, uh, the spike itself, it is able to evade our immunity, uh, specifically our B cell or our antibody immunity. And this, why, this is why one of the big reasons why you still have um, people who are getting infected even with the booster. But again, remember, the vaccines are not meant to prevent infection. They are meant to prevent severe disease. There is also a thought there was a recent um, preprint publication which did show that um, 
people, secondary attack rates in households were really about the same, whether it was with uh, Delta or with Omicron. So uh, what that tells us is those people are still able to get infected. Uh, when you compare the two households though, or compare people who've been boosted and vaccinated, people uh, who were boosted and vaccinated had less of a chance of getting Delta. So we know that there are changes there. We know that uh, the Omicron is able to evade our antibodies. And one of the questions is, yes, now do we start to make specific vaccines towards Omicron? Up till now, we've had very good um, uh, experience with the vaccines. We still do have very good experience with the vaccines in preventing hospitalization and severe disease and death, but there is a consideration and we do know that the companies are looking at making a specific uh, Omicron related uh, pivot or, or vaccine to that. But we also have to expect that other variants will come in behind this and displace Omicron eventually. So, um, you know, it is a convoluted answer, but yes, we know some companies are. It may be valuable, but we also know that we still have quite a bit of value in the vaccines that we already have. All right. Hawkeye, final thoughts from today. Yeah, you know, I think uh, this, this show really centered on public health, uh, public health guidance and, and pillars such as masking, distancing, understanding those situations that you're in, trying to be in those good ventilated areas or outdoors, hand hygiene, and of course, vaccine. And we know those things are uh, helpful in preventing severe illness and hospitalization and really the whole spectrum of disease, really, if you will. Vaccination is so important. We know that Omicron is going uh, rapidly and spreading throughout the community. And we talked about uh, schools uh, being in session right now, but keeping schools in session because we know that although not a majority of uh, the virus is spread in schools, we know that it can be spread in schools. And so using those masking and those distancing to help keep those adults in that school safe and help keep those children safe because we know uh, the virus can affect children as well. My, uh, my sister's family is dealing with it right now. She has three uh, children. One is six. He is fully vaccinated. He had a sore throat uh, and, and some GI upset for a couple days. Uh, he's been fine after that. Now uh, her two youngest that are um, four and two unable to be vaccinated are uh, kind of down and out right now. And she just texted me this morning saying how um, her vaccinated child is doing well, but the unvaccinated are not. And they have a lot of fatigue, malaise, they just aren't feeling good. And she wishes they could get vaccinated. And so you hear that, those individual stories, and, and that is not unique. We know those individual stories are there all around. It is very important to use vaccination. We know vaccine can overall reduce the whole spectrum of disease, even if it doesn't necessarily reduce infection, it can reduce the whole spectrum of, uh, of COVID-19 disease. And I think that's important as we move through this community, especially when we're talking about either young children who can't be vaccinated or even those older and uh, those older populations with comorbidities, it's important to get those vaccines in those arms. You know, here's what I would say, Jess, and then I'm gonna to toss it back to you to talk a little bit about tomorrow. I think one of the things we had a great conversation with the mayor about today, but one of the clear challenges for us is the difference between truth and fiction. Somewhere along the line, telling the truth kind of went off the rail. And, and instead, people just make it up. And, and when people make things up or they, 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 they deal from this position of suspicion and paranoia, then it's really hard to make public policy that's going to help folks. And ultimately, this becomes a character issue. And my kids were young, and, and we were raising them together, and, and uh, well, my wife and I, and, and, and you know, we try to teach our kids the importance of telling the truth. Because when you tell lies, lies do what? Lies grow, and then they, they compound on each other until the, the absurdity finally points you to the truth. And, and I think what we're seeing is that too often, um, uh, we're testing our character and we're not, we're not coming clean with the truth. And so ultimately this is a character issue. And it's very hard to have a meaningful conversation in public when all people want to talk about is, 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 is stuff that's just not true. You want to have a conversation about masking in schools, the impact on kids about masking, that's an honest conversation about the mental health of children 
versus their physical health and how we make sure we are able to take care and keep hospitals open. That's a fair and honest conversation. But when you start saying, well, masking doesn't work or vaccines don't go to work, you say, those are, that's not true. Mm -hmm. And so now we're trying to combat fiction as opposed to having an honest conversation. And ultimately that becomes a reflection of all of our character. Mm -hmm. What I hope going forward is that's being born out of this pandemic is there will become an epidemic of truth. That the next great thing that we're challenged by is how we're trying to have enough candor with each other that we have an honest, meaningful conversation as opposed to just trying to throw stuff out there to try and be right. And that, that doesn't help us. What helps us is when we tell the truth. Dr. Stites, thank you so much. Great show, great conversation with Mayor Lucas today. Tomorrow, a double whammy for two of the hardest hit counties in the metro, from fewer people vaccinated to a very high positivity rate. We kind of know those go hand in hand. Last week alone, the positivity rate in Johnson County approached 31%, while in Wyandotte County, the big concern is the fewer number of people who have gotten the vaccine. What the counties are doing to combat these numbers and what they say needs to be done. We'll talk all about that coming up tomorrow. We will see you at eight. With Dr. Stites podcasts. Now everywhere podcasts are available.